Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. What does Jesus' mission look like here? What's his mission here? What does Jesus' mission look like here? What does Jesus' mission look like here? What is Jesus' mission here? How do I know what Jesus' mission is? Good morning and good to see you today. My name is Josh and one of the pastors here, if you don't know me, and uh, welcome to all of you joining us online today as well. And um, uh, moms, happy Mother's Day. And uh, we are grateful for you and uh, just glad, glad for you. We all, we've all got a mom and um, we wouldn't have life without her. And uh, we're grateful for you, so thanks. <clears throat> it reminds me, um, you know, for many, and Pastor Dave mentioned this, that uh, Mother's Day can be one of those days that's a joy. It can also, for maybe many more, <laughs> be a day that's full of pain and, and maybe for the most, somewhere in between. You know, if you've, if you've lost your mom, if you uh, have wanted to be a mom, but God hasn't, hasn't given that to you for whatever reason, um, you just need to know um, and hear this. Your value, ladies, your dignity, your worth, um, to our church, more importantly to the Lord Jesus, has nothing to do with whether or not you're a mom, has everything to do with the fact that you're created in his image, that he loves you, and, uh, and we love you. And uh, after the service, you know, if, if you are struggling, if today's a hard day and you'd like somebody to pray with, there'll be people available to pray with you, and um, some other ladies, and uh, some of whom have been, been down those roads themselves. And so, there's no pressure, and it may be one of those things, I don't feel like it today, well, maybe another day, but just know you're loved, and uh, don't miss that. You know, on, on Mother's Day, speaking of, um, there was a, a guy who gave his, his wife for Mother's Day um, an iron. Sorry. Well, he learned his lesson when on Father's Day he got an ironing board. <laughs> and uh, he, he learned his lesson on that one. Well, today, we're going to be in the book of Acts again. We're going to be in Acts chapter 28. We're, uh, we're uh, slowly getting our way there to the end of this New Testament book. And uh, so if you've got your Bible, you can turn there to Acts chapter 28. And I'm going to pray. And then we're going to jump in right away there in Acts 28 verse 1. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for your goodness and your grace to us, your kindness. And um, Lord, I pray today... Uh, you'd help us just see that, that you do, you orchestrate and uh, are in control, at least of every situation, that your, uh, your love never escapes us, your provision and your protection uh, is never um, pulled, pulled from us, but that, but that we're yours if we trust in you and um, that we can trust you through any situation. So help us see that today in the life of Paul, in the life of those he's with, and then help us to see it in our own lives, Lord, that we can trust you and follow you and uh, love those whom you've sent us to. Holy Spirit, I pray you'd help me as uh, we unpack your word. Um, help me to teach well. Help us all to understand the things you've written and apply it to our lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've got your Bible, you can turn to Acts chapter 28. And where we're picking it up today, uh, Paul has just finished... And him, along with uh, like 270 some other people, this journey across the Mediterranean Sea that ended on the island of Malta in a shipwreck. Like they took off, Paul's on his way to Rome as a prisoner for preaching the gospel and everything's going good, they get to Myra. And the main trade route from Myra to get to Rome would have taken them on the ship they were on around Crete over to Malta and then eventually up to Rome. Well, a after they... Uh, get to Crete, they decided to go a little farther before winter than they probably should have in the weather. And a huge wind comes down and sweeps them out to sea, and chaos ensues. And over the next couple weeks, 
They're getting tossed and driven all about, and they're throwing stuff overboard, trying to survive. And finally, towards the end of those couple weeks, they see land, but they don't know what it is because they really don't know where they've been. It's been dark, and it said the sun and the stars didn't shine for two weeks when Luke gave that account in Acts chapter 27. And at the end of uh, chapter 27, here's what we read. Here's what we read. Um, Now, when it was day, they didn't recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, just to run the ship ashore. Uh, So they cast off all the anchors and they left them in the sea at the same time, loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. See, what had happened is uh, they had gotten to this point where they had seen land, they threw down anchor, hoping, waiting for day to come, the verse right before that said. They're waiting for day, and so now they see land, it's, it's coming to be day, they see the land, they're like, get rid of the anchors, get rid of everything else, the wind's blowing the right way, I think we can run it ashore and get off of this thing. And Paul's on this ship as a prisoner going to Rome. Many others are there just paying their fare to go on this same ship. So that's what they do. They cast off the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders, which the rudders were just like these big oars on the front of this kind of a ship. And then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach, but they didn't make it. Instead, they strike a reef that they didn't see, and they ran the vessel aground. The the bow stuck and it remained immovable, and the stern began being broken up by the surf, by all the crazy power of the waves. So then the soldiers' plan, the the Roman soldiers who were on the ship, who had some prisoners they were taking to Rome, they were going to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape, because if you're a Roman soldier and one of the people you're guarding escapes, guess who gets their sentence? You do. So they're not going to let that happen. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, this was a guy named Julius, who Paul had good rapport with. He was the main commander. He kept them from carrying out their plan, and he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make their way to the land. And then uh, the rest on planks or pieces of the ship. And so it was that all of them were brought safely to land. You know, uh, that's pretty remarkable circumstances, isn't it, that Paul's in in this moment? And they have this shipwreck and they go on shore. I wonder, for you, what are some of the circumstances of your life today, this month, this week, this year? Whatever the circumstances might be for you, you know, it might even be to the point of Uh, Maybe you're not in a literal shipwreck, but life feels like a shipwreck. And it just feels like everything's crashing and pushing ashore and the waves are beating in and I don't know what to do. Well, one of the things we can take courage from after reading the end of the account we studied last week is to remember this, that God is still in control. He's still in control. Isn't that good news? Do you remember where I told you the trade route from Myra went to before it went on to Rome? It went to Malta. Well, they didn't even know that was Malta. But by God's grace being still in control, he still brought them to the place that he had planned for them to be. And so that he could get them and get Paul to Rome where he had planned for him to go. It's pretty remarkable. I wonder if you've ever had those situations where life totally does not go according to your plan But somehow, in his own miraculous way, God kind of works things even that are incredibly, incredibly hard and uses them in the end to move you in your life and to provide for you in ways that you had always kind of hoped and trusted that he would. He he does that often. He's still in control no matter the circumstances. And so I want you to remember that this morning. And even as we get into Acts 28 now and start reading about uh, what's going to happen on this island after the shipwreck, to remember God orchestrated uh, or oversaw at least, however your perspective wants to be on that, all of these things that he could work them ultimately for Paul's good. 
And in the same way in our own lives, he can work all of these circumstances, some that we'd never choose, that we would never have picked for ourselves, and he can use those and oversee them in such a way that he would use it for good. A lot of times, well, let me, I was listening to a friend of mine preach recently. His name is Curtis. Curtis is a great guy, and some of you have met him. If the rest of you ever get to, I hope you do. Uh, but Curtis was preaching, and he said, you know, sometimes um, I've got a lot of friends who just, they want to follow Jesus, and they want God to hook them up. You know, I'm going to follow Jesus because I know if I follow Jesus, everything's going to get great. I'm going to get hooked up by God. But he said what they fail to recognize is that oftentimes God doesn't hook us up. He sets us up. He sets us up to grow us to be more like Christ. He sets us up uh, to mature in our faith. And Paul's setback in this moment is, is actually a setup for what's about to happen they're on this ship and they, they crash ashore and they got the little rudders up there. They had thrown the lifeboat over. Uh, everything was gone when they crashed. And I wonder if uh, Paul even remembered some of these Psalms, that the steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. If you remember the passage last week, Paul was delighting in God and God established his steps. Even though he falls, he won't be cast headlong for the Lord upholds his hand. He had promised Paul that even they were going to be in a shipwreck, but everyone would survive if they just trusted him. Not that it would be easy. Do you suppose Paul still got hurt? I don't know. It seems like it'd be kind of impossible that a lot of guys didn't still get hurt in the shipwreck. I mean, you saw that boat, right? That thing crashes into a reef, breaks apart, you fall down. It still hurts, but God saw them through and he established their path. He upheld them. They didn't fall headlong to where there was no hope. Uh, Paul really can write this then when he writes to the Philippians. He knows how to be brought low. He knows how to abound. How in any and every circumstance he's learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And he can do all things. Any of those things. He can make it through with Christ who gives him strength. So just on the front end, before we see what happens, keep these things in mind. And uh, as we trust the Lord, you need to know whatever your circumstances, he will keep you. He will. He completely will. Let's look at chapter 28 now. Chapter 28, after we were brought safely through, there, did you see that? He kept them. They were brought safely through this storm that lasted for weeks, where multiple times they all thought they were going to die. <coughs> and God brought them safely through. And then they learned that the island was called Malta. Malta. Wasn't that a stop on the itinerary to begin with? This is incredible. It's like getting lost without a map and still landing in the same town you were setting out to get to on vacation. None of you have probably ever experienced that, have you? Getting lost? But by God's grace, that's where they end up. And the native people there showed us unusual kindness. The guy writing is a guy named Luke, who's a doctor. Paul's probably a personal doctor, a good friend of his. And he's with them on this journey. Maybe he paid his own fare to go. Maybe the uh, centurion Julius let him come along. We don't really know. But he's writing. He, he was there for all of these things. He says, the native people showed us kindness, unusual kindness. For they kindled a fire. They welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. Uh, God showed them unusual kindness through the people there. You know, it's kind of similar in, in really uh, any kind of disaster today, isn't it? Like if some natural disaster happens, people tend to rally and, and with kindness and goodness and befriend people and help them even for a short time. Wow. It, it's similar in that day. They, they, God has woven some of those things into our hearts that, that desires help and love and care for people. Um, and when, when Paul, uh, Paul didn't consider himself above anyone else, he started gathering bundles of sticks to help build the fire too. And when he gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, what he didn't realize was in that bundle of sticks 
was a snake of some sort who in the cold had become probably a bit lethargic and he didn't know it was in the bundle and couldn't really see it. And he throws the bundle in the fire, right? And a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on its hand. Now, don't be afraid next week if you go out for engage to pick up a bundle of sticks. <laughs> it'll be okay. So, but here's what Paul does. He says, well, when the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, oh, this guy must be a murderer. No doubt, though he's escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. You notice in the ESV, justice is capitalized. Uh, the translators there have uh, thought that that word justice is probably, because in the Greek, there's no capital letters in the ancient Greek. And so they're thinking that probably refers to a Greek god named Justice who would revisit justice on people. And there were uh, many stories in uh, Roman literature and mythology and all kinds of things of uh, both in reality and in mythology of people uh, who were murderers being on the beach. One guy in particular laying on the beach gets bit by a snake and dies after he'd escaped. They're thinking that's what happened to him. That's what's going on here. But remember, uh, we already said God was going to see him through, didn't we? He brought him safely here. He's going to get him to Rome. What's going to happen to Paul now? However, Paul shook off the creature into the fire, and he suffered no harm. Well, they were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. I kind of wonder if they were placing little prop bets in the back, like, I got five bucks in the next five minutes. He's going down. <laughs> They're just waiting for it to happen. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, they changed their minds. They said, well, he must be a God himself. They couldn't understand the, the kindness that had been exerted to him. Like, how, how did he live through that bite? Because they surely recognized it as a venomous snake and that he was going to die. And so they saw him as a God. This happens other times in scripture where they, they look at Paul after he performs a miracle, they think he's a God, and then they start to worship him. And uh, in, in, in Lystra in particular, and he rebukes him and says, don't worship me, I'm not a God. And so we can assume that he, we're not told that he does that here, but he probably does something similar here and responds in the same way. But they had to be wondering, well, then why didn't he die? Do you know why? Look back at verse one. It's the Lord who brings him safely through. Now, this isn't a promise that you can go up and, you know, pick up a venomous steak and let it bite you and you're going to live and everything's going to be okay. That's just kind of foolish. It is to say, though, that God's purpose is for you. He will complete. And that he will work through even situations that seem impossible or deadly and continue what he's planned for you. One of the best examples of this and, and promises of this comes in Psalm 121. And in your life group this week, your life group study in your handout is, is all about Psalm 121. Psalm 121 goes like this. I, I lift my eyes up to the fields. From where does my help come? And this song was a song, if you notice at the top, it says a song of ascent. So they would sing this while they're going up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. And so they're surrounded by the mountains, they're surrounded by the hills. And likely when it was written, it was written by someone who uh, in the hills, in the wilderness was facing danger and looking around going, where am I gonna find help? Where does my help come from? Then they answer their question, my help comes from the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. For you, where does your help come from? Does your help come from the Lord? Do you wait on him? Or do you kind of weasel your way in and try to make your help come from you? I've been guilty of that. Probably will be again. But the reality is our help comes from the Lord. No one or no thing else. In fact, as you trust him, he will not let your foot be moved. This would have been a great promise to them as they're climbing up 
a, a rough road heading up in elevation up the mountain, right? He who keeps you will not slumber. But when they would sleep along the way, out in the dark, in the wilderness, you'd want somebody watching for wild animals, wouldn't you? But the one who keeps you won't slumber. So you can, you can, you can rest. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. I gave you Psalm 1 last Sunday, if you remember. I said, hey, I'm trying to memorize Psalm 1 this month. Some of you maybe already have. Here's, here's another one for you. Where does my hope come from? My hope comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He who keeps you will neither slumber nor sleep. Right? He will keep your life, Trent. Whatever the circumstances, he brought Paul and that whole crew safely through. His promise to you is he will keep your life. He will bring you through. His, hear me. His promise is not that life will be easy and rosy and wonderful. And there'll be no hardship and no pain and no sorrow. But he promises in those moments to keep you. He will keep you. He will be with you. As Jesus said, the whole of every moment. And then one day, yes, all those hopes and dreams for life will be true when Jesus comes and fully restores everything. But in the meantime, he'll keep your going out and your coming in now and forever. So, you know, I don't know about you, but that gives me some confidence that even in, in some of the darkest times of life, even some of the hardest situations, God's still in control. He will keep me and keep my life. So it gives me confidence then, even in the midst of those hard, hard things, to keep going, to know he's in control, and to keep living for him. And if we think about it in terms of of the mission Jesus gave the church, it, it means that whatever my circumstances, God has sent me to love the people that I come in contact with in the midst of all those things. Whether that's in the hospital or whether that's in my neighborhood or whatever is going on, God still sent me into those situations to love as Jesus has loved. And uh, to love people. And, you know, sometimes that's a, you're like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Other times you're like, huh? Okay, what people are we talking about? Because some people, let's be honest, some people are easier to love than other people, right? Well, I think God sends us to love everyone. First, he, he sends us to love the greatest, to love the greatest people. Let's look now back at Paul in Acts 28. Think of the ordeal he had been through. Maybe he had been hurt in some way, shape, or form. At least maybe skinned up his knee. Who knows? On that trip off the boat and making his way into shore. And now here he is. He gets bit by a snake. Shakes it off into the fire. And he's called to love the people that he's been sent to on this little island called Malta, which was, by the way, about 18 miles long and about 8 miles wide. First, he loves the greatest. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island. And by the way, there's archaeological evidence showing that this was a, this was a term for, for someone in that island that had been set up by the Roman, uh, Roman magistrate to oversee the island. The, the chief man, the, the ruler, leader of the island, his name was Publius, who received us and, and entertained us hospitably for three days. Now, we don't know if he received all 276 of them who were on the ship or if he just received like Julius and Luke and Paul and a few others. But nonetheless, they go to this, this man's home for three days. 
It'd be like if any of you who watch Survivor, like you get off Survivor and then you go to this place and you get nurtured and, you know, uh, all, all dolled up and cared for and eat all kinds of food and cleaned up for, you know, two weeks after enduring it out in the wilderness. Well, now they go to this guy's home and all of a sudden he's rich and wealthy and they're there for three days and probably get restored in some way. What well, happened while they were there that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. Maybe he had been playing a lot of Oregon Trail. <laughs> Some of you get that joke, some of you don't. But he's really sick, and this, this fever is actually, there was a fever known as uh, Malta fever. It, it would last anywhere from a couple weeks to a couple years, and it came from a microbe in goat's milk on that island. And so a lot of people, as I've read this week, tend to think that that's likely what Publius's father had had this Malta fever, and so he was sick. And, and so Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, he healed him. Paul went and loved this man, whom he didn't know, whom he never intended to run into. But by God's grace, as he gets thrown on shore and he just loves those people, like all of a sudden now Publius comes and opens a door for him to go hang out with him. And, Oh, by the way, my dad's really sick. Really, can I, can I see him? Can I talk to him? Can I pray for him? And he goes and prays for him, and he's healed. See, sometimes God sends us to love those who are the greatest and who are on the social tier, like way up there, that we think, oh, I don't know if I could love them. Or... But we're sent to love them. Paul does that here. That's why Peter says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor, whoever is in control and in charge. To love the city where I've sent you, God tells this people through Jeremiah. Well, they were in exile. They'd been taken into exile by a foreign land and uh, moved out of their homeland forcibly and God says, while you're there, love the place I've sent you to. Well, I think Paul probably thought in the same way. I crashed onto this island, love the people God sent me to. Wasn't planning on a shipwreck, but here I am. How about for you? Next Sunday, we get an opportunity to do this as a church, right? To go out and love the community he sent us to. But not only the greatest, also... Uh, to the least. We're also said to love the least. Uh, look at the next verses. Paul does that as well. When this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. And I mentioned, I say that they were the least, you know, they were, um, the, the term Luke uses there, Luke was a Gentile raised in a Greek home is literally, the natives is literally the same words that's translated the barbarians, which meant anyone who didn't speak Greek and was outside of the norm of Roman, Greco-Roman culture. They were just different. They were out there. They were not us. And Paul goes to love them. Who are the least that he sent you to? And they too honored us greatly, Luke says. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. God blessed them through, through these friendships with, with people that we have no idea if they ever trusted Christ. That's a good reminder to us, too, as, as believers, that uh, God, in many ways, sends us to people, and, and it's good for us to befriend people who don't know the Lord, and maybe some who never will, because he sent us to love everyone. And they became, Paul evidently became, we learn in the next verse, he was there for three months, became friends with these people. Who's God sent you to that maybe you don't agree with on hardly anything, but that you could befriend and love? And who knows how God might use that in the future? We're sent to love people. And in fact, uh, as far as the least, Jesus said, um, talking about the day of judgment, he, he, they, they'd come to him and be like, uh, when did we see you in the streets and we served you or cared for you? He says, truly, I say to you, you did it as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. 
So as we love and serve people, we're loving and serving Christ. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. The Lord will repay. And then if anyone would be first, Jesus says, um, in my kingdom, he must be last. I'd be a servant of all. So whatever the circumstances, you can trust God's in control, which then gives us confidence to say, okay, I don't get it. I don't like it. But what's God doing? And how do I love the people he sent me to? And not only love them, but then also to invite them. To invite them. Invite them in what way? Well, I already mentioned one, right? Invite them to friendship, to relationship. Maybe invite them to church. Again, we get an opportunity just to go out next Sunday. I encourage you, come join us. If today's your first Sunday and you're like, that sounds fun, come join us. We'd love for you to come next Sunday. And we're just going to go out and serve in our community and and love people. And by God's grace, there's going to be opportunities to invite people into friendship to invite people into relationship. Maybe to invite them to church. Who knows? But there's all kinds of invitations we can make with people as we love them, isn't there? Um, You know, Jesus did this with a guy named Zacchaeus. Do you know who Zacchaeus was? If you got your Bible, you can turn to Luke uh, chapter 19. It's not gonna be on the screen, but it is in your Bible. Uh, Jesus entered Jericho, and he was passing through, verse 1. And verse 2, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So Jesus is going to some of the greatest there in Jericho, isn't he? And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. Or some of you, if you grew up in church, you maybe sang the song when you were a kid, because he was small in stature. He was a what? He was a wee little man, wasn't he? Zacchaeus. So he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree. He was also an agile little man. For he was about to pass that way, Jesus was. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down. I need to come to your house today. What was that about? Well, Jesus was inviting somebody who was totally far from him, who was the greatest in his community, and he was at least wealthy, right? Who also, though at the same time, was one of the least because he was outcast and hated because of his role in the government as a tax collector. And Jesus befriended him. He said, hey, I want to come to your house today. Think that'd be okay? Okay. And so Zacchaeus has him come and he hurried down, came and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. See, when you, when you really love people, sometimes other people are going to grumble. Why are they loving them? Why are they doing that? Why would you cancel your church service and go serve people? Other people, though, will see it and go, wow, look at the love of Jesus. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. He befriended him, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I'll give to the poor. Look how it changed him. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. See, the invitation then goes beyond just relationship and friendship, though, to an invitation to follow Christ, to follow him with us. But a lot of times, I don't know if you've noticed, the invitation to follow Jesus usually doesn't work if that's the first invitation. Usually the first invitation is an invitation to relationship and an invitation to friendship and an invitation to love them. That's what Jesus did with Zacchaeus. And then, after all of that, what did Jesus do? He invited him to follow him, and he did. That's what next week is all about. 
It's that invitation to relationship, that invitation to friendship, with the hope that in the future, or maybe even next week, can there be an invitation to follow Jesus with us? And we see Paul do that here in Malta, and so we have courage to do it right here in Milford and in Wawasi. Whatever the circumstances, friends, God has sent you to love people and to invite them. Amen? Hey, let me pray, and we're going to sing and call it a morning. Father, thanks for Jesus. Thanks for your grace and your kindness to us. Thanks for your invitation, Lord, uh, to friendship and relationship with you. Thanks for your kindness that even when we were far from you, far from you, your enemies, even, Jesus, you died on the cross for us. And you rose from the grave to, to give us your life and invited us to follow you. So help us to, to live in the same way, uh, to love those you've sent us to, Lord, to recognize that sometimes even the hardest circumstances um, may be um, an opportunity that, or that there may be an opportunity you could work out of those circumstances to where we would have joy and others would receive the good of friendship and the good of salvation and that you would be, be honored and glorified. Give us courage in that, I pray. I do pray for next weekend, Lord, as we head out to serve. Um, give us courage to go out and, and truly love people um, and uh, we look forward to a great weekend then and a great week ahead. And Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.